Have y'all, anybody uh, ever learned how to ride a bike? Does anybody ride a bike? I don't know if they do that anymore. We play them on the video games, but I don't know that we ride them. So I remember teaching my kids how to ride bikes. And so I just, all I remember was running behind them for hours and hours and hours. You remember that? I couldn't do that today. Just going out, I'm just telling you. But I remember... See, when, you, when you're going to get on a bike, this, this really spoke to me when it comes to transition. When you're going to get on a bicycle, you can't get on the bike and put your feet on the pedal first and then start. If, are you all with me? You can't. I mean, maybe if you've got great balance, you can. But you have to almost, how many of you know that, that when you get on there, there's a timing thing that happens. You're almost kind of like pushing the bike. So there's got to be movement. And in that movement, it gives you the ability to start pedaling, get on the bike, and begin to balance. Without the movement, you can't do it. And in transition, a lot of times in transition, where we go wrong is we, because we're in a transition, we want to stop. And we, we want to get our arms around the thing. And we, we say, we're, wait a minute, I'm in transition. I can't do that. But really what you need to do is you need to move through it so that you can get through it. And if you try to stop and you try to just get on the bike and balance on the bike, but you don't start moving. And so a lot of times we get stuck in transitions because we think we need to stop. I'm too busy. I've got this circumstance. I've got this transition I'm going through, and I just can't take on anymore. But really what we need is we need to move through it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible says this, but we all Seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces, as in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Let me unpack this. It says, but we all, that means this word, all of us here are being transformed into the, it says the same image. It is the image of God. God desires for every single one of us to be transformed into the image of God. And it works from glory to glory. In other words, you don't get it all up front. In other words, there's something about living your life. And as you live your life and you experience God... You grow from glory to glory. So there should be glory to glory growth in every Christian. You shouldn't be where you were 20 years ago. You shouldn't be where you were five years ago. There should be something evident in your life that you're glory to glory or else something is not right with the transformation. Right? The word works all the time. So, God, listen, God is intending, and, and he says something in here that's super, super important. It's when we see the glory of God with unveiled faces, right? When we see the glory. So, uh, the question, a lot of people, you know, we say, we talk about the glory of God. We, we can talk, and it's very uh, difficult to explain the glory of God. But if the glory of God and me seeing it has a key to my transformation, I should know what the glory of God is. The glory of God is not always just seen at an altar. The glory of God, it's the manifest presence of God in my life. It's when I watch God do things that I know only God can do, when I see it with my spiritual eye, I'm exposing myself to the glory of God, and that thing begins to change me. If we want to transform, we got to see the manifest presence of God. You can't see it if your face is veiled. 
Now, what this scripture was saying, what Paul was saying was, in the Old Testament, before Christ, Moses came down with the veil. The, it was veiled to the people. The law was veiled. It, we couldn't see straight. But when Jesus came, if you remember, when he died on the cross, what was ripped from top to bottom? The veil. The veil ripped from top to bottom in order for two things to happen in your life and in my life. So that I could have access to the Holy of Holies and so that I could see in the Holy of Holies. Because the veil does two things. It blocks me from the, ho- from the place I'm trying to get to and it obscures my vision for what God is doing. But Jesus came. So I'm telling you here, listen, if you're born again today, if you've accepted Jesus, if you said yes to him, if you've applied the blood over your life, come on, if you've repented of your sin and you said yes to him and you're a child of God, you're a son of God, you're a daughter, I'm telling you, there, the veil has been ripped for you. And today you have access to things. Sometimes we don't know what we have access to. And sometimes we forget to see the things that we're supposed to see. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, he went to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist baptized him in the Jordan River. And we always focus on the part of where he comes up out of the water and the father affirms. Do you remember that? The father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Well, two other things happened when he went down in the water. When he went down in the water, the first thing that happened was the heavens were open, it says. He says, he came up out of the water and the heavens were open. What does that mean? That means that kingdom access was granted. Kingdom access was granted. And then the second thing that it says, it says that he, not only did he get kingdom access, it says then he saw the spirit descend like a dove. You can't see spirit. With your natural eye. What happened was not only was kingdom, was access given to him, but revelation came. And when revelation comes, transformation comes. See, what we need today is we need to understand the access that we have to him. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to see God different. To get revelation knowledge. It was a picture. Jesus' baptism was a picture of what was going to happen three years later at Calvary. It was a picture. It's the same thing. It was the, it was, it, when he died, what did he do? He gave me, when he, when he shed his blood and they beat his body, what did he do? He gave me access to the Father. And, he gave, and then when he rose from the dead... <laughs> When he rose from the dead, when you come up out of the water, he gave me the Holy Spirit to show me, to guide me, to give me revelation. So transition is so critical to growth. It's not a time to hold back. It's a time to push through. It's a time to keep moving. It's not a time to... to, to decide, I got to hold back because it's just chaos right now. Sometimes you got to push through the chaos. Listen to me, chaos is never going away until we get to heaven. You're going to have chaos in your life, in, t- in this life. In this world, there will be trouble. In this world, there will be trials, tribulation, and persecution. Some of us think we are experiencing persecution right now. You don't even know what persecution is. Come on, we're just worried about being embarrassed. We're not worried about persecution. Come on. We're, some of us are like, I don't want to preach because I might be persecuted. You don't even know persecution. You know, you just don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> so God wants us, I want everybody to understand, God wants you to move from glory to glory. He's interested in your growth. To be transformed, you got you got to go. You, you you grow through transitions. Sometimes we pull back in transitions. I'm saying we have to push through transition, 
And I want to give you three things, just three things that you can do to grow in transition. Simple things. Simple things. I was sharing, I forgot where I was sharing this. It was at Man Church. I don't know if you know, but I'm trying, uh, I'm a little overweight. Some people say I'm not, but I am. <clears throat> Thank you for not laughing and clapping or amen and amen. <laughs> um, so I want to lose, I, I'd like to lose some weight, right? I'm, I'm 53. I have researched every program there is out there to lose weight. I'm telling you, I can tell you every program. I've been around a long time, so I've seen all the infomercials. And I, I realized I'm, I'm really an expert at what to do, even though I don't show it on the outside. I know what I need to do. So somebody the other day was like, Danny the other day was trying to, hey, I got a, I got a person that's a nutritionist. She can do this for you, and she can go do and get you a list. And, you know, part of me was like, yeah, brother, that sounds great. But then in, in, my, my, in my own reality, I was like, I don't need anybody to, I know what I'm supposed to do. Like, not, don't go to Whataburger. Like, that would be a good start. <laughs> Come on, right? Like, I know, isn't it funny how even in the Word and when we study the Word, it is not difficult. We know, we, we know, we've been reading it a long time, and he says to us in there, don't do this, do this, stay away from that. Right? He, he gives us the prescription, but it, it does absolutely no good until I decide I'm going to get committed to this thing. Come on. When I get up here and I'm thin, you're going to know he got committed. <laughs> right? Come on. I'm putting myself on blast so that I can, I'm trying to build some accountability in me. And we can know the word, right? We can, it, can, we can, it says it. He's, he's so clear. The first thing practically that you can do to make sure that you transition well is stay positive. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's crazy. It's not crazy. How many of you know that the majority of us now, there's an anomaly of y'all in here that are always positive. I don't think anybody's in here like that right now. The majority of us, we will run to the negative. Come on, Art, won't you? We're going to run to the negative. It's not, it's not hard being negative. It's like a baby. A baby doesn't have a problem being selfish. It's born selfish because if it's not selfish, it does not live. So we don't have to teach selfishness in the church. We've got to teach unselfishness. You see what I'm saying? And so we have to stay positive. The Bible says things like life and death are in the power of the tongue. How many of y'all have heard that? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. In other words, you have the power with the words that you speak to bring life into a situation in a person or to bring death into that situation. You have the power to do that. How many of y'all believe that? Huh? How many of y'all know that now? How many of y'all know that that's hard to do 24-7? Because sometimes you want to kill some things with your words. You want to say some things. That, but God is saying to us, if we want to transition well, let me, listen, adults, if you're in here, adults, we have to demonstrate how to do things well. When, when he gave us Matthew 28, when he gave us the commission to make disciples, he says, teaching them to observe the commands. How do you teach somebody to observe the commands? You got to live it. You got to demonstrate it. It can't be taught with an explanation. It can't just be a note card, a note that you wrote. It can't just be a summary that you give somebody. You've got to show somebody this is how you obey his commands and observe his ways. So as adults, that's our, that's, that's the ball that we carry in this game of life is to be a demonstration for those coming behind us. So listen, transition is so critical to you because you are going to show the next generation how to transition. 
And you're showing them either how to transition well or you're showing them how to transition bad. But you're always showing. Come on, we're always teaching. Everything you do is teaching. Somebody's watching you all the time. Somebody's watching your life. Somebody's, it, it could be your children, it could be your wife. So we have to stay positive in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. Sometimes even reckless words. Is there, are there any married people in here? Reckless words. Come on, you get in a situation. Okay, maybe nobody in here. Just look straight ahead, okay, so, so you won't get. Maybe it happened today. You get in a situation. And you say something reckless. The Bible says that that pierce is like a sword. Have you all ever heard that? So words are like toothpaste. Right? When you squeeze toothpaste out of the tube, that toothpaste that came out, it is not going back in. It is out. I can give you a toothpick. And tell you, here, put that back in there. And you'll be there all day. You can't get, you can't get it back in. That's how words are when they're spoken. Now listen, don't get condemned today. If you've spoken bad words, bad things over your people, you need to own it, confess it, and apologize. But the better thing is don't squeeze the tube. Come on, when you're in the argument, just picture, don't squeeze the tube, baby. Just hold the tube. Don't squeeze it. Don't squeeze it because if it comes out, it's out. When we squeeze, our words have power. We have to stay positive with what we're saying, what we speak. See, some of us only speak what we see with our natural eye. I remember when we were raising our, 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 our oldest, my wife would, we would, you know, anybody have trouble cleaning the rooms? Kids, you're in here today. Is that you? Anybody ever have trouble cleaning the room? If you've had, hey, kids, if you have your, uh, your bulletin, I want you to write a big positive sign so that you can remember to stay positive. Because this doesn't apply just to the parent. This applies to you too. As you're going into this transition of school, you've got to stay positive. We, were, we, we, used to, we used to try to get to the girls to clean the room, and it was never coming out like we wanted it. And, and Yolanda just said, man, I'm going to try something different. She walked up there, and she was like, wow. Or my, or my daughter was moving really slow, and my, 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 daughter, my wife walks up to my daughter, and she's like, she's moving slow. And Yolanda's like, wow, you're so fast. <laughs> Come on, calling things that aren't as if they are. And you know what happened? She started speeding up. She started like, I am? You know? I'm fast? Yeah, wow. Wow, can you pick up that towel fast? Can you put it in the hamper? And all of a sudden, the cleaning the room became a game. But she wasn't fast before. But she could go in there and start saying, man, you're so slow. Man, you're a slob. Reckless words. Piercing the soul. And when they get older, they're gonna, you're going to have to deal with that wound at a church. Versus going in there and saying, how can I help you? Come on, let's get after it. And listen to me. Listen, I've raised, I'm, I'm raising kids. So I know you're like, ah, yeah, I don't know if I can get there. Because when you're in the heat of the battle, it's a whole nother deal. Right? Am I right? When you get in the heat of the battle and you've been telling them to clean for like 10 days and it's still not done. Kids, it's going to be okay, okay? I'm, 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 I'm not getting on to you. I'm just saying. These are the things that we deal with that can cause us, it can cause our self-talk to get negative. And when we get negative, we create a negative atmosphere. And then our children are raised in this negative atmosphere. And all they know is the negative atmosphere. So when they raise children, they raise them in that same negativity. And so God wants us to break the curse of that and to become men and women of God who speak life in every situation. We can always find something that's missing. Come on, you can always get negative, you can always find something wrong. Why not be the people that find something right? 
Why not be the people? I'm not saying that we don't need to correct. We do. There's time for correction. There's time for discipline. There's time for rebuke. But it can't be 99% correction. So he's saying, I want you to stay positive. I want you to think positive. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do we fill our mind? What are we thinking about? What are we saturating our life with? I said this at, at Man Church the other day. If you're always saturated with the things of the world, and you, you're like a sponge, and you're in this water of the world, and you're just soaking it in day in, day out, when life comes and it squeezes you, and it will, what will come out of that thing is what you've been saturated with. So when you're squeezed, some people say that hard times build character. No, hard times only reveal character that was built. You see what I'm saying? You build character when times are good. When there is no circumstance, when there is no situation, and you're in church, and you're in Bible study, and you're in worship, you've moved your sponge into the the things of God, and you're saturated with the things of God so that when trouble comes or transition comes and the squeeze comes, the word comes out. It's, it's kind of insanity to, to saturate yourself with social media all day long and, and then for, the, for, for, for the, the, the squeeze to come and to expect there's got to be some God coming out. Right? I mean... Oh, it, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, we, at a certain point, what we're thinking and what we're saying is coming from the inside. It says it comes from the heart. The issues of my mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. My heart's like a sponge. What am I, what am I putting my, what commitment have I made to put myself in the saturating presence, manifest glory of God so that the manifest glory of God can begin to transform me? We got to be separate from the world. We can't, we're not of the world. And we've got to be doing, saying, thinking, and doing. The second thing, so the first thing is stay positive. The, se- the second thing is ask for help. Ask for help. Sometimes our preferred route is to go at it alone. I know I'm like that. I don't want to call anybody, I don't want to ask anybody. I just want to. Come on, how many, how many of y'all are lost somewhere? My wife gets mad at me all the time. She's like, just pull over and ask them. Oh, I got it. I got it. We don't need all that. We're going to be late. She goes, we're going to be late already. You don't know where you're going. You know? I got it. I got it. I got it. One time I had this big old back barbecue bin in the back of my truck, and she's like, why don't you just go ask my, your na- the neighbor to come help you get it down? No, I got it. I got it. I, I'm like, why? I know I don't got it. It's like, what is it in a man that doesn't want to go across the street and say, hey, bro, can you help me get this down? So it sat on the back of my truck, and I went everywhere for about a week before I unloaded it. (laughs) Come on, sometimes when you don't ask for help, you carry something you shouldn't be carrying for longer than you should carry it. God's been wanting to free you, but you're unwilling to ask for help. It's right in front of you. What is that? In us, as humanity, that we're like, no, nah, I got it all. Nobody, I'm not letting nobody into this. See, God designed it that we need each other. I think he had to design it that way because if, cho- if, if it was a choice, we probably wouldn't choose it. So God designed it and he said, man, I'm going to be in them and I'm going to have a relationship with them and then they're going to have a relationship with each other and those two things working together are going to transform them into the image of God. Oh, man, because God, you know, God can do certain things, but man, people can do certain things. Right? Do you know anybody can get under your skin? Do you know anyone that, that, that kind of challenges you, challenges you? Do you have your thought that maybe you're a challenge? Because <laughs> we're always looking at who the challenge is. Man, they're challenging. Man, they're challenging. And everybody's like, 
yeah, man. And underneath, they're like, yeah, you're a challenge too. Come on, right? And there's certain things that only get worked out when I get around people. People start, you know, we start kind of like, you push me, I push on you. And, and we think that it's a, we think it's the devil. Because we don't want to die to ourselves. And the first sign of hurt that we get in a church, we want to run. And God's trying to chisel you to look like him. The first sign of it, we, we look like, man, I'm offended. And God's like, I'm about to knock some edges off of you. That's what I'm trying to do is knock some edges off you. Sit still. We keep jumping off the potter wheel. You know, God's trying to make something. We keep jumping off the potter wheel. I'm like, oh, that hurts. Oh, I didn't like how that felt. I didn't like the worship. It's okay. It wasn't for you. It was for the king. We come in here, we think it's for me. That's how we all come in. Don't get, don't get, don't get twisted. We come into church trying to get something for me, but really we're here to serve him. And God, that's the transition. That's the transition he's getting to us, and he's doing it transition over transition over transition. Ask for help. Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, there's so many scriptures that say, 1522 says, without advice, plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 2018, plans succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but the wise man listens to advice. There's so many scriptures about asking for help. But yet we don't ask for help. It's like, it's also the same concept of the diet. We know what we're not supposed to eat, yet we still eat it. There's nothing new. There's nothing difficult. It's a matter of commitment and discipline on our part. And allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us in that way. And to say, man, I want to be committed to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start asking Advice. I'm gonna before I step out into big things. I'm gonna get some people around me that I trust that I can talk to. Because it works all. It it actually when you ask for help, it removes pride. And it instills humility. And if you're in here thinking, but I'm already humble. Don't say that. Don't ever go to somebody and say, man, God's really been humbling me and I'm really getting, I'm seeing some progress. Don't say that. Let somebody, somebody else needs to tell you that they're seeing the humility in you. You don't need to tell people that you're so humble. Because in telling them that you're humble, you're not. You're prideful that you're humble. Right? We need, we need humility. All of us need humility. All of us need to know that, 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 that if it weren't for God and if it weren't for the cross, if it weren't for the resurrection, that we'd be in a world of hurt today. We all know that and we all need to remind ourselves about that. Asking for help drives out the independent spirit. I've, sh I've shared that with you before, you know, in our, in our American lifestyle, we're always pushing everybody to get independent, right? We're raising our kids. I want you to get raised up, and I want you to get out there on your own and be independent and pay your own. We really, what we mean is we want you to pay your own bills. <laughs> we wrap it up in independent because then it's not about money and we don't look bad. We want you to be independent. We want you to be independent, but yet you become a Christian, and God is saying, I need you to be dependent on me for everything. Whew. That's rough. So we raise up in the house, like, hey, we want you to get out there and be independent, but yet God is saying, no, I want you to totally depend on me for everything. That's kingdom. And we need people to drive that independent spirit out of us to think that, hey, I don't need anybody. I can do this on my own. I don't need, I'm not going to take your advice. I don't need a mentor. I don't need somebody in my life. It's all a lie. Because the devil's after your purpose. 
And if he can keep you unsubmitted without a mentor, without people, if he can isolate you out of the way, you will be ineffective in the kingdom. He doesn't even have to kill you. He just makes you ineffective. He just moves you out of the way, ineffective. You're not going to do nothing. You're not going to do nothing because everywhere you go, everybody's going to know that guy is hard to deal with. He's unsubmitted. He doesn't want to do nothing. He's on his own. He, does, he, has his, he marches. He's got an agenda. And it's the enemy. The enemy's divide, the, 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 the slithering snake is still slithering around this world today, whispering in people's ear, saying, you don't need anybody to tell you what to do. You can be your own person. You determine what's good or evil for you. There's nothing new under the sun than what happened in the garden with Eve. He slithered around and told her, hey, you determine what's good and evil for you. You become your own God. And he's doing it today in the church by just saying, you determine what's good and evil for you. You don't need that pastor telling you what to do, that leader telling you what to do. Come on, you decide whether you're a male or a female. I'm going to leave that one there. It's the same serpent. He's got nothing new. He's defeated. You know, he, 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 we give him too much credit. He is in a panic because his time is short. Jesus is coming. And he's in a panic. He doesn't have any power. He only has the power you give him. So you got to speak positive, you got to speak life with your words and your mouth and, and your heart, and then you've got to ask for help. you got to ask for help, and then you've got to rehearse the victories. That's the last one. You need to learn how to look back and understand that you've been through other transitions. You have been through other transitions in your life, and it's, this one's no different. And God, it reminds me of the story of David when David showed up at the at the. At, at the battle, and Goliath was there tempting the Israel army. And he walked up, and he's like, why has somebody not already grabbed this guy and slit his throat? What is going on? Come on, everybody's in fear, and, every, and, and David's like, what is, what's, why are you letting him do that? Why are you allowing that to happen, him to defy our God like that? And then Saul pulls him around and he says, and David says, hey, man, I'll go kill him. I'll kill him. Nobody here wants to kill him. I'll kill him. Saul's like, hey, you're too small, bro. You're small. He didn't talk. He didn't say bro. It's that's not in the scripture. <laughs> that's just how it played in my mind. I'm just talking like it plays in my mind. That's how I read my Bible. He's like, hey, man, he's like, you're too small. Listen, and David reminds it. David sits there and starts rehearsing. He goes, hey, I don't know if you know, you know, I've been watching my dad's sheep for a long time. And while I've been out in the field, that lion came one time, and he took a sheep, and I caught him, and I opened his mouth, and I took the sheep out of his mouth, and then I stabbed him in the throat. The original gangster. <laughs> Come on. He goes, I grabbed him by the beard, and I stabbed him in the throat. I was telling first service, I don't know how that went down. I mean, some of y'all might think he grabbed him and stabbed him with a knife. I'm thinking, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. It just depends on your background and how you want to play it out. I mean, he, he, and then he said, and then not only the lion, the bear showed up, and he tried to do that too. I did the same thing to him. He goes, I'm going to do that to that giant. He was so confident that God was with him. He was so confident. Even the king wasn't confident. David walked up in there and go, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing, bro. Just give me, hey, give me the shank. <laughs> give me the stones. Give me the stones. He went and picked five stones, and he nailed that guy. Sometimes the transition can look like a giant to you. You got to grab that thing and take it out. Take it out. Don't play with that thing. 
Don't allow it to have, don't allow it to fill you full of fear. Be confident in who you are. God did it with the lion. He did it with the bear. He did it from sixth grade to seventh grade. He did it from seventh grade to eighth grade. He did it from eighth grade to ninth grade. And he's going to do it from ninth to tenth because he's been doing it. And, it, and, and adults, if you're going through a transition, same thing. The biggest mistake we can make is we can look to our sixth grader and they're, they're facing a transition from sixth to seventh grade. And if we're not careful, we, we belittle their transition because we're 53. And we start saying things like, Mom, that ain't nothing. What are you worried about? Listen, they're worried. Every season of your life prepares you for the next season. Every, see, you've got 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth to 12th college. You've got that season behind you. And that's why you can stay there and look back and say, that ain't nothing. But for that person that's in that season, that's not what you tell them. You go down to that season with them and say, come on, I'll walk with you through this season. I've been down this road before. It's been a few years, but I know the pitfalls here. Listen, you don't want to go down that alley over there, right? We don't want to go this way. We want to go that way. And so God gives us the ability to rehearse what God has done in our life so that they, when they ask me for help, I've got some help to give because I've got victory in that area. Some of us have, have think that we have no victories. Some of us feel like we're so far over here that we can help nobody because we fail to recognize all of the victories. Get a journal and write down all the time that God transitioned you. Start writing them down. Write down, God did this. This happened to me. Some of us have left jobs and we thought, we, remember before you left the job, you're thinking, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it. And today you're making it better. Come on. Come on. You... But when you back up and before you walked into it, fear kept in, right? That, that giant crept in and was like, I don't know, you're not, not making it. He's taunting the, the Israelite army. Transition is a time of growth. God wants us to grow. Every season of life prepares you for the next season. I want you to stand to your feet with me today. <clears throat> I want you... I want you to, to, I want everybody in here, if you're in here right now and you're listening to my voice, and listen to me, we can, this word applies to the believer. In fact, I'm going to say this, some of us are in here with veiled faces. And even what I've said, eh, I don't know. It's an indication of a veil. It's an indication of not being born again. It's an indication of not having a relationship with God. And I want to say this to everybody that's in this room today. I never want anybody to leave here if you don't have a relationship with God. And I'm not going to, I don't even have to really explain it because you know. Are you living for him? Is he real to you? Do you have a relationship with him or are you far from God? And if you're far from God, you don't have to leave here far from God. I'm telling you today, he died on that cross today. And all that's necessary for you to accept him and to be born again is for you to accept his sacrifice, to accept his free gift of grace. He didn't care where you've been. He didn't care where you were last night. He didn't care what you did. He doesn't care what you're addicted to right now. It's not about getting your life right right now. It's about God's moving in your heart right now and something on the inside of you saying, man, I've got to have something change. i got to have something different. I want to know God that way. I want to know. And if that's you, listen, if you're far from God, don't leave this place without making it right. It's that simple. You just got to make it right. You just got to step out of your chair. Get out of your chair like you really want him. Don't come down here if you don't really want him. Just come down here if you want him. Come on, let him out. If you want him and you say, man, I got to be right with God. I don't know him. I want to be right with him. 
Come on, look around. If you see somebody that's trying to come, make it easy for them to come, church. Make it easy for people to come. Make it easy. Pay attention to who's around you and what they're looking like. If they're swaying back and forth, if they're gripping the back of their seat, because I used to do that. Oh, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Who else needs to come? Come on. And all over the building, whoever else needs to come, don't let the day go. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of getting right with God. Today is the day. It does no good to try to transition without him. You can't. If you could do it without him, you would have already done it. Oh, praise God. Praise God. People are still coming. People are still coming. People are still coming. Come on. Sometimes we get in a hurry, like when it comes to the altar time because we're hungry. We get in a hurry and we don't let God move. My prayer for every person that's down here right now, when I, when I was 21 years old, I sat, I sat in a jail cell. And I had an encounter with Jesus. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what to do. I just knew I couldn't live not one more day the way I was living. And that place has held me for 33 years. I go back to that place frequently, not to live in it, but to remind myself of it. When I want to quit, I go to that place. I'm praying with all my heart that tonight, right, I mean right now, today, at this altar, you're finding that place. Because without that place, it's hard. Church, stretch your hands out. I want to be clear with this. I want to be clear with this. The minute you moved, Jesus has come. This prayer, the prayer doesn't save you. It's your faith responding to him that saves you. This prayer, we're just agreeing. We're going to seal it with a prayer today. So stretch your hands out, church. Let's pray together out loud. Everybody at the altar, pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sin. I give my life to you. I make a commitment in front of witnesses to live for you all the rest of my life. In Jesus' name.